Howdy. This video is on Van der Waals equation, Maxwell's equation, and Graham's law. Van der Waals equation can be used to calculate parameters for non-ideal gases. It's an empirical equation. It has correction terms for when intermolecular forces are no longer negligible and for when the gas, the bottom of the gas particles themselves are no longer negligible. Maxwell's equation relates average speed, temperature, and molar mass for gases. Graham's law can be used to calculate the relative rates of effusion and diffusion of gases. After watching this video, you should be able to describe how Van der Waals equation is related to the ideal gas law and related assumptions. You should be able to use Van der Waals equation to calculate different macroscopic parameters for gases. You should be able to describe the relationship between kinetic energy and average speed for gas particles. You should be able to calculate relative rates of effusion and diffusion of gases using Graham's law. And so the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. Um, there's two approximations for the ideal gas law. Intermolecular interactions of the gas particles are negligible, and the bottom of the gas particles themselves are negligible. Also for the ideal gas law, notice that the identity of the gas does not matter. If it's behaving like ideal gas, which gas it is does not matter. Now the ideal gas law breaks down at low temperature because at low temperature, um, intermolecular forces become important. All gases, if cooled low enough, will condense. Ideal gas law also breaks down at high pressure because you imagine at high pressure you have a lot of gas particles and so the volume of the gas particles themselves is no longer negligible. Now it's kind of interesting, if you cool a gas down, the volume obviously decreases, we've seen that before. Now if you cook it cold enough, eventually it will stop behaving ideally and eventually the gas will condense. So for an ideal gas, the volume at zero Kelvin is zero. But again, again, all gases will stop being behaving ideally before you get down to zero Kelvin. And so PV equals nRT is the ideal gas law. Now if we divide both sides by nRT, we get PV over nRT is equal to one. And so if a gas is behaving ideally, PV over nRT should be equal to one. Now this is a plot of PV over nRT versus pressure. Now this dashed line represents one. And so at low pressure, all these gases are behaving ideally. PV over NT is equal to one. And then you see as you increase the pressure, uh, the gases are behaving less ideally. And so an interesting question would be, which of these gases be behaves least like an ideal gas? And so it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, what we're looking for is the biggest deviation from ideal behavior, the biggest deviation from the dashed line. And so that would be ammonia. And ammonia, you know, you have uh, hundred, uh, hydrogen bonding, and so it's gonna have the strongest intermolecular forces. And so under high pressure, low temperature, gases stop behaving ideally. And so we can actually calc still calculate parameters for gases, but we have to use something like Van der Waals equation. There's actually a series of different empirical equations trying to take into consideration non-ideal behavior of gases. Van der Waals equation is one of the more common ones. And so here's Van der Waals equation. Now it looks a lot like the ideal gas law. So you can imagine the thing in the square bracket is your P and then here's your V and so you have PV equals nRT. Now there's a correction term for your pressure and that takes into account the intermolecular forces. And so you imagine that your measured pressure isn't really as high as it should be because the um, gas particles are attracted to each other. And so that's why we have the correction term here. Um, volume minus NB. And so this is a correction term for the volume of the gas particles. And so the volume accessible by the gas isn't really as large as it should be because other gas particles are taking some of the volume. And so this correction term is for intermolecular forces. This correction term is for the volume of the gas particles. Now the N is the number of moles, V is the volume. And so actually this is an A parameter. And each gas has its own A parameter and its own B parameter. And so Van der Waals looks a lot like PV equals nRT, but again, you have correction terms for intermolecular forces and a correction term for the volume correction for the bottom of the gas particles themselves. And so for chlorine, its A is 6.49. Um, that's atmosphere is liter squared per mole squared. Its B value is 0 0.0562 liters per mole. 
And so if you have eight moles of chlorine in a four liter tank at 27 degrees Celsius, now we know that at STP, one mole should be 22.4 liters. This is eight moles and four liters. We're not at STP, but we're close. And so this should be really high pressure. And so most likely this isn't going, to, chlorine isn't going to behave ideally under these circumstances. And so we can calculate the pressure using the ideal gas law, and we get 49.3 atmospheres. We can calculate the pressure using Van der Waals, and we get 29.5 atmospheres. Huge difference. Um, and so it's not just a small modification, but you can get large differences under very high pressures. You know, the gases deviate from ideal greatly. And so I mentioned that, you know, in these correction terms, you have the A and the B, and different gases have different values for A and B. And so here was for chlorines. Um, if you look at helium, you know, helium has a smaller A because it's going to behave ideally over a wider temperature range. And so Van der Waals is an empirical equation trying to take into consideration non-ideal behavior of gases. Now, if we think about kinetic molecular theory, you know, all gases have the same average kinetic energy at the same temperature. And so temperature to me is a measure of kinetic energy at the atomic level. So all gases have the same average kinetic energy at the same temperature. Higher temperatures higher, uh, gives you a higher average kinetic energy. Gas molecules are in constant motion and frequently collide with one another. Although not all the molecules in a gas sample move at the same speed, the higher the temperature of the gas, the greater the average speed and kinetic energy of the molecules overall. This higher level of energy allows molecules to disperse more readily, which is one reason we smell aromas better when temperatures are higher. So again, all gases have the same average kinetic energy at the same temperature. Higher temperatures correspond to um, higher kinetic energies. Now all gas, actually if you look at a gas, you're gonna have a distribution of speeds, kind of like distribution of speeds on a freeway. Cars on highways travel at a variety of speeds. To show the distribution of automobile speeds, we could plot the number of cars moving versus their velocities. Molecules in the gas phase show the same variability of speed. Plots of molecular speed distributions are called Boltzmann plots. At any given temperature, the molecules of a gas are in continual motion. At any instant, some molecules have more kinetic energy of motion than others. With increasing temperature, the average kinetic energy increases in proportion to the absolute temperature. This graph shows the distribution of molecular speeds for a particular gas at two different temperatures. Notice that the most probable molecular speed, given by the peak of the curve, increases as the temperature increases. Here we see a mixture of two gases with different molecular masses, helium and neon. The more massive neon atoms move more slowly, but they possess the same average kinetic energy as the helium atoms. At a given temperature, the distribution of molecular speeds for helium is much more spread toward high speeds than for neon. As the temperature increases, the average speeds of both helium and neon atoms increase. At any given temperature, their average kinetic energies are the same. So a lot of stuff in this movie. One is, again, please remember that all gases have the same average kinetic energy at the same temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the average kinetic energy. But you have a range of speeds for the molecules. Now, speed is different than kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. And so here we have neon and helium, and they're plotted number of atoms versus speed. Now, they're at the same temperature, so they have the same average kinetic energy. Now, the helium has a higher average speed because it's lighter. Again, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, and so its mass is smaller, and so it's gonna have a higher speed. The lighter, the faster. Okay, so all gases, same average kinetic energy at the same temperature, but the lighter gas particles will have a higher speed, but the same average kinetic energy. Now we can actually look at a wider range. And so again, these are corresponding to all the same temperature. And so they all have the same average kinetic energy, even though their speeds are very different. 
It's kind of interesting if you look at it, as you go from heavier to lighter, what's happening is you're going to a higher average speed, but you're also, the distribution is getting broader. But again, at the same temperature, they have all this exactly same average kinetic energy. Now we can also look at these distributions as a function of temperature. And so here's oxygen at 25 degrees Celsius, oxygen at 1000 degrees Celsius. And so you have a larger average kinetic energy, the higher the temperature, but it's kind of interesting going to higher temperature, you see you go to higher average speed and you go to a broader distribution. And so it's kind of interesting, you see the same trend. We go to lighter particle, we go to higher average speed and broader distribution. We increase the temperature, we go to higher average speed and a broader distribution. Now, because there's a range of speeds, a, a broad distribution of speeds, what we often talk about is a root mean square speed. And so V is velocity, you square, you take the average of that, that's what that line represents, and you, then you take the square root. And so this is the root mean square speed. Um, it's just basically an average speed. And Maxwell's equation says the root mean square speed is equal to the square root um, 3RT over M, where R is the gas constant, T is temperature in Kelvin, and M is the molar mass. And so you see from here that the bigger the T, the larger the root mean square speed, the bigger the molar mass, the smaller the root mean square speed. Now diffusion and effusion depend on the root mean square speed. And so the bigger the speed, the faster the rate of diffusion and effusion. And so diffusion is the gradual mixing of molecules of different gases. And so gases mix in, in a room. If you let off a little bit of, I don't know, let's just say CO2 in a corner of a room, eventually the CO2 will go throughout the room. That's diffusion. Effusion is where you have a gas um, on one side of a barrier and then a vacuum on the other side, and then the gas particles will effuse to the empty side of the container. But the effusion and defusion rates are very similar in terms of their de dependencies. And so for diffusion, the bigger the mass, the well, the bigger the mass, the, s the smaller the root mean square speed, the slower the rate of diffusion and effusion. And so bromine, Br2, um, the bromine atomic mass is about 80, and so Br2 is 160 grams per mole, per mole, and so that's pretty big, and so the diffusion rate of bromine is pretty slow. Now, in, in the center state, Br2 is actually liquid, but again, all liquids have a vapor phase, and so you can actually look at the bromine vapor. A stopwatch is started at the same moment as a few drops of liquid bromine are placed in the bottom of a test tube containing air at atmospheric pressure. The bromine rapidly evaporates at room temperature. The reddish-brown bromine molecules diffuse up the tube. Although the bromine molecules are moving at speeds of several hundred meters per second, their constant collision with nitrogen and oxygen molecules of the air cause them to constantly change direction so that their overall movement up the tube is rather slow. Thus, after two minutes, they are only about halfway up the test tube. It actually takes over three minutes for the bromine molecules to diffuse up to the clamp near the top of the test tube. And so bromine has a very slow rate of diffusion and effusion because it's got a large molar mass. Now one thing, kind of the inter interesting thing is the bromine particles are actually moving really fast, but because there's a lot of collisions, um, the rates of diffusion and effusion are not that fast. And so the rate of diffusion and effusion is proportional to the root mean square speed. We saw that the root mean square speed is equal to the square root of 3RT over M, where M is the molar mass. And so what we see here is that the rate of effusion diffusion is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. And so this tells you is that the bigger the molar mass, the slower the rate of diffusion and effusion. Now, if you wanna compare the rates of two gases, the diffusion or effusion, 
um, say the rate of A versus rate of B is going to be equal to the square root of the inverse of their molar masses. And so if the rate of A is on top, the molar mass of A is on the bottom, the rate of B is on bottom, the molar mass of B is on top because of the inverse um, relationship that we saw right there. And so the lighter particles will diffuse and effuse faster, the larger particles will effuse and defuse slower. And so it's actually grand, Graham's law. It governs both effusion and diffusion of gas particles. And so we can look at an example. So which diffuses faster, ammonia or HCl? And so nitrogen is 14 grams per mole, hydrogen is one. And so that gives us 17 grams per mole. HCl, chlorine is 35.5 grams per mole. Hydrogen, so that gives you about 36.5. And so the ammonia should diffuse faster than the HCl. And so we get about a rate of 1.5 faster for the ammonia than the HCl. And so when ammonia and HCl react, they'll actually form um, something that looks white. And so we have ammonia on this side and HCl on this side. And what we should expect is that because the ammonia is faster, we'll see the reaction occurring mostly on the right side of this tube. On the right is HCl gas, and on the left is NH3 gas. Where the two meet, a reaction occurs producing ammonium chloride gas. The reaction occurs primarily on the right because NH3 is lighter and diffuses faster. And so again, the lighter the gas particle, the faster the gas particle. That's kind of interesting. During World War II, the first bomb grade uranium-235 was actually produced using gas diffusion of uranium hexafluoride. And so uranium was mined. Um, uranium-235, I think, is, is less than 1% naturally abundant. It's the only naturally occurring fissionable material. And so for a nuclear bomb, you need at least 90% uranium-235. And so you have to s separate out the uranium-235 from the other uranium isotopes which is kind of hard. And so what they did was they made uranium hexafluoride, they did gas diffusion, and the lighter gas particles will go faster, and that's how they actually separate out the uranium-235 from the other uranium isotopes. Um, currently, centrifuges, I guess, are actually used for that. So Van der Waals equation can be used for non-ideal gases. We can see a, a large deviation from ideal behavior under high pressures. Maxwell's equation relates average speed, temperature, and molar mass. All gases have the same average kinetic energy at the same temperature. Uh, temperature is just a measure of motion, uh, kinetic energy at the atomic level. The lighter the gas particle, the faster the gas particle. And so at the same temperature, they have exactly the same average kinetic energy. But again, the lighter one will move faster because kinetic energy is just one half mv squared. Graham's law can be used to calculate the relative rates of effusion and diffusion. Um, the, rel the rates of effusion and diffusion are inversely proportional to the square root, should say the square root, of the molar mass. I hope that was helpful.